Hi, everyone. So excited to have everybody here. Okay, so I'm going to just start with a quick overview. Stay, Becky and Katie, because um, I'd like to uh, begin the program by saying that this is going to be an exciting hour where we're going to talk about special education and the reading crisis and four action steps to be able to accelerate reading for your students who struggle. Um, with us today is Becky Mengel, and Becky is a treasure. She is a retired elementary school principal, as well as a, a former teacher, and she's now working um, as a professional development director at Readable English, and she just recently retired. So she is fresh with lots of uh, feedback and um, insights to share. Then we have with us Katie Brew, and Katie is a special education resource teacher at Franklin Central Junior High School. And she's gonna be, um, we're gonna structure this such that um, Becky is going to give the academic portion of the program. And then Katie is going to give the, in the classroom, what's really happening stories. And then we want you to all engage uh, in the chat and ask us questions so we can all share. So I'm Rita Ferrandino. I'm going to be your moderator. And um, I wear two hats. One is I am the innovation consultant at the University of Pennsylvania's Graduate School of Education. And um, we look at uh, innovative programs from around the world. And so I came to uh, this uh, presentation having been invited by Readable English, the sponsor. Uh, and they are one of the innovative companies that we do work with. Um, and I'm also the uh, founder of ARC Capital Development. And um, uh, I put my contact information there for you all because I will be um, available via LinkedIn and Twitter to answer any questions you may have um, after the event or in two weeks if you... If you um, Find yourself, you know, waking up in the middle of the night with, oh, my gosh, I have a question from the presentation you just asked me or Becky or Katie. All right. So let's get started. Now, we are here because Readable English is uh, graciously sponsoring this event for you and the continuing education credit. So thank you to Readable English. Um, so if there are any of you who are in need of um, a research-based um, accelerated reading program uh, that uses phonics and phonemic awareness, the contact information is right there. They would be delighted to talk to you and show you uh, more about how the Readable English program works. And Readable English does use the four action steps that we are going to talk about today in the professional development section. So thank you, Readable English, for um, gathering us all here today. Now, quick poll, just so we know we can tailor our presentation. What is your role in special ed? Just go right up there and fill it in. Well, it looks like we've got a lot of teachers here with us and we've got resource teachers here and some read literacy specialist. Just just click right on so we we can make sure that we give the right information to the people that are on the webinar. So a lot of you are putting that right into the chat. Thank you. And if you want to do the poll, that would be even better. Both work. It looks like we have a lot of paraprofessionals with us. You serve such an important role in our school, so we thank you for that. Great. And we've got some ELL specialists. So I am going to close the poll. And what I think is fair to say is that we've got a lot of classroom teachers, we've got a lot of resource people, and we do have some literacy specialists with us and some administrators. So thank you for conducting the poll. Now, what we're going to discuss today, now remember, because you are gonna get a continuing education credit, we are going to go over professional development uh, content. 
And what we're going to focus on today is special education and the reading crisis. And we're going to break it into four action steps. The whole idea is that you um, take from the professional development tools that you'll be able to utilize in your classroom tomorrow. Um, because we want to make sure that everything that we're doing and saying can be put into easy bite-sized tips that you'll be able to take with you. So we're going to talk about assessment. We're going to talk about performance. We're going to talk about actions you can take and how to monitor progress. But let's just take a, another quick section to conduct another poll, which is, have you conducted any reading assessments in school this year? Well, it's interesting that we've got a quarter of you that are not having, that have not conducted any reading assessments this year. Keep on voting. Wow, this is terrific. Good. So what we'll do is make sure to cover that topic. Terrific. So this question is, do I have one assessment that tells you if students are at grade level? And it looks like we have about 80% of you um, have an assessment that tells you if, if students are at grade level and 20 of you don't. Great. Okay. I'm going to invite Becky Mengel, who is a retired elementary school teacher. As of when did you retire? Was that June of this year? June of this year. Yes, just past year. Great. Well, we're going to invite you to now take our, our participants through four actions to accelerating reading and starting with assessment. Well, thank you. I am delighted to be here to talk with you today about assessment. And we know as classroom teachers, special education teachers, that you spend a lot of time gathering information and gathering data. And we believe this information we're sharing today is going to help you hone that practice and we're going to give you some information and research about three particular assessments that we believe will help you understand your students' individual performance even better than you already do now. So I'm going to go ahead and start with talking about those three assessments. They are words correct per minute, accuracy rate, and comprehension. And I'm going to start with words correct per minute. So most school corporations have benchmark assessments that they give beginning, middle, and end of year. Um, I do want to bring to your attention that typically um, assessments third grade and up really um, test only comprehension. So that's why words correct per minute and accuracy rate are very important in the process of understanding how a student is performing. Now, words correct per minute, you figure that out by using what's called a passage reading fluency text. It's a 60 second, one minute cold read and in that process, in that time, the teacher, you, would be uh, you would be counting the number of words total read, and you would also be counting the number errors that students would commit maybe during that 60 seconds. I'm going to refer to a third grade student of mine and use his data throughout uh, this whole presentation. So if I have a third grade student, he's going to take a third grade passage reading fluency assessment. And this young man um, read 99 words. He had eight errors. So that gives us a fluency score of 91. Now that we have that score, what does that score actually mean? And before you again is that calculation if you wanted to keep track of that or write that down. So we use a fluency chart um, that's been created by Hasbrook and Tyndall. I'll put that in the chat when uh, Katie's doing her presentation. And we use that as a nationally normed fluency chart, and it allows us to um, be very uh, precise in determining a student's independent reading level. So on this Hasbrook and Tyndall chart, we're going to look at the fall benchmark. That's this assessment we took. And at third grade, it tells us that he should be reading 109 words at the 75th percentile. And that's really very important. 50th percentile is not high enough. It's not rigorous enough. We really want students reading at the 75th percentile. So we didn't quite make the mark for third grade. So then we bump to second grade and we take a look at second grade and it says 84 or 86 words per minute. I should have that memorized and I don't. But at that point you think we've read 91, 
84 or 86, that's probably a better indication of where that student is reading. So we're going to hold on to that information. And now we're going to move on to accuracy rate. So it's very important to determine accuracy rate because what the outcome we're looking for is increased comprehension. And if we do not have a high accuracy rate um, and fluency, um, we're not going to get to that level of comprehension. As, as many of you know, if you give a passage to a student and they're attempting to read it and they get to the third or the fourth or the fifth word and they encounter a word that they're having difficulty decoding, there's a really strong indication that they're not going to remember what they've read up to that point. So in knowing that, the research tells us that we want our students reading between 90 and 94 percent with an accuracy rate. And I know that seems really high, but that is what the research tells us is needed in order for students to be able to comprehend that text. Now, let's talk a little bit about how we would calculate accuracy rate. Accuracy rate is going to begin with taking the number of words, that fluency rate. And we determine that by taking 99 words correct minus the eight errors, and it gave us a 91. And then we're going to divide that 91 by the total number read, which was 99. And as you see the math there, we at the end of that, uh, we are going to multiply it by 100 in order to get that percent. And you'll see that our young man is reading with a 91.9% .9 accuracy rate. So these two pieces of information are incredibly powerful. Not only do we know that his benchmark assessment, his level fluency level was about beginning of second grade, we now know that his accuracy rate was about 91 to 92%. So those are two incredibly important pieces of information. Let's talk about that third piece, comprehension. Now we all know comprehension is the ability to read and understand, restate. Um, students have to be able to code. We have to be able to attend to the task. We have to be able to connect to information we already have. One issue that I would like to make sure we, we think about with comprehension is we talked about third grade. Um, the only score that's helping you determine their reading level is a comprehension score. And we can see when we talked about words correct per minute and accuracy that it really isn't enough information to just use comprehension. And something that we've um, titled or, or coined the phrase as submarine effect, I'd like to share with you now. So in many cases, this is C level or grade level, and this is where students should be performing. But after a comprehension assessment, they quite frankly could be very far down below that surface, what we call the submarine effect, the submarine level. So it tells us, oh no, their comprehension level is incredibly low. But in reality, because we don't have words correct per minute and we don't have an accuracy, accuracy score combined with that, it really isn't enough information to know if that's really the case. The other piece that we know about so many of our students, if we read something aloud to them, they can restate, they can recall, they can ask questions, they can use context clues, they can infer. So it really tends to lead us to believe that maybe comprehension isn't the issue and it's the access to content or the reading material that may very well be the problem that we're facing. Rita? Great. So what we would like is if anybody, I, there's some questions in the chat. Mm -hmm. Becky, I love the whole concept of the submarine effect. I'm sure there's mm -hmm. probably some questions around that. Yes. So let me um, read off to you. Um, he's reading third grade text, though. I yes. Guess. So I, I'm assuming that the, the question is settling around using the Hasbrook and Tyndall fluency chart. So it is our, our best guided um, using a nationally normed fluency chart that allows us to take that assessment. Yes, they are reading a third grade assessment and they're reading it at 91 words correct per minute, which tells us that they are not quite reading independently at the third grade level. And that chart is a guide to help us see that second grade is most likely the place where they read most fluently and independently. And that's how we utilize that chart. Great. So is there any more questions? 
All right, looks like we have had all the questions answered. So thank you, Becky. So now that we've heard um, mm -hmm. from you, let's go to the next piece. Thank you. So now I'd like to talk about reading performance. So when we think about performance, we wanna make sure we really understand what's in that data, what's hiding. And now that we know words correct per minute, and we know their accuracy rate, and we have a comprehension score, we have a better picture, an overall picture of how our students are performing. And so now we take this information and we work with our school intervention team. Uh, for 20 years as a principal, it was called GEI. It had been called RTI. Um, it is the MTSS, I believe now, and there's a variety of different names. But what I can tell you, the name may change, but the conversations stay the same. It's about how do we get students on a trajectory to be at grade level by the end of their school year? And so while we're working on that plan, that team comes together, it's typically tier two, tier three students in special education. Um, you know how I mentioned the comprehension, um, the concern about the submarine effect, that in essence, it appears as if their comprehension is much lower, um, when in essence, it may very well just be that they cannot access the text. I want to bring caution to um, another concern, especially if you receive any of your data in color-coded fashion. So I would sit in our team meetings as a former principal, and I would be thrilled when I saw the number of students who were in green. For us, green meant at grade level. Blue was above, yellow was just below, and of course, red was substantially below. So anytime we saw green and blue, we were celebrating, and our time and our energy and our focus was on, of course, the yellow and the red. Um, up until about three years ago, when I learned of all of this information, this research, um, I have to tell you, I didn't know what green meant. And it's imperative that we understand what our assessment data is telling us. So I would encourage you to go on a fact-finding mission. Talk with your literacy specialist or your Title I director um, and find out the assessment and the data that you're receiving in a color-coded fashion, what does it actually mean? You can even research um, the assessment yourself, and I'm sure that there's other information out there, but I would really encourage you to, to make sure you find out what that means so that we are not falsely celebrating a 50th percentile. In some cases, uh, green may mean 30th percentile, and we all know that that's not high enough. We talked about it earlier. We wanted it to 70 or the 75th percentile. So I would encourage you to do a little research and see what you find um, if you're receiving any of your data in that format. Thank you, Becky. Before we go to Katie, we've got quite a few questions and many of them are, are basically around the chart. Where's the chart mm -hmm. you missed? Where do I see the chart? Um, could you just answer that question for everyone? Yes, the chart was created by a team their names are Hasbrook and Tyndall. Um, I can put it in the chart, but it's H-A-S-B-R-O-U-C-K. And Tyndall is T-I-N-D-A-L. And it is a nationally normed fluency chart. If you just put it in your search bar, you will be able to find it. Great. Thank you, Becky. So now we're going to turn it over. So that was the theoretical uh, portion. And now we're gonna hear from Katie, who's gonna take us through what she's doing in her classroom. Thank you, Katie. Thank you, Rita. I am very excited to be here as well to share with you guys this incredible program that we have rolled out this school year. Um, so in the fall, when we started rolling out this program, we completed benchmark testing for both our seventh and eighth grade students, since we are a junior high. Uh, we completed benchmark testing in both passage reading fluency and comprehension. Uh, the tool we used for that is called EasyCDM, uh, so we were able to assess where students are compared to their gen ed peers. It allowed us to interpret their words per minute, the number of comprehension questions they can answer out of 20 after reading a passage, and then that accuracy rate. And as Becky said, that is so important. If they cannot read the words on the page, they are really going to struggle with that comprehension piece. So as you can see in the middle picture, um, that is kind of an example of a benchmark assessment or a probe that we use. Um, I just mark as they read, uh, they get a copy, I get a copy, and I just mark out the words that they may miss. 
It is very easy. It's immediate results for both my students and myself. Um, looking at the performance, uh, we were able to determine exactly where our students were. Um, I have been very fortunate enough to loop with my students. So this is the third year that I've had them, which has been great. Um, but unfortunately, we haven't been able to find a program that seemed to be working for our age students, um, which is very alarming. Um, obviously, being a special education student and being in my reading class, I knew that my students were low. But this assessment tool allowed me to pinpoint exactly where my students were. With this data, I noticed that 85% of my students were reading at least one grade level behind their peers, some even reading five to six grade levels behind peers, um, which is alarming as a teacher. Um, as a teacher who really cares about their stu students, wants the best for their students, I kind of had that wow moment and realized that we needed to find something to catch these kids up. Um, at the middle school level, and I'm sure some of you can relate, I'm, I was worried. Uh, seventh graders, eighth graders, they're going to high school next year. They're going out into the real world very soon that we need to get them reading at least to a level where they can function in society. Um, so myself and my team, my special education director, we were determined to find a plan and to close that gap. So we were able to take this data, take all this information that we received from this testing that we had and create a plan. Um, obviously, as a special education teacher with special education students, every student has an IEP. Most students, if they're in my reading class, have a goal set for reading. So it was not more work on me to create all this extra stuff. It was just a better program to use to be able to monitor where they are. We were able to create goals and expectations, and this was very student involved. We were able to see where they are and determine where they want to go. It was transforming. I knew that we needed to find something to transform their reading. Um, and this program, Readable English, did just that. So I'm very excited to continue to tell you guys all about it. Rita, I'm going to transfer back to you for some questions, if, had, if any. Okay, so put your questions in. Um, I'm going to ask... Um, what is the software being used on the picture with the laptop? Yes, that is the program Readable English. So with the program, each student gets a login information. Um, and that is called a Glyph game. And we'll kind of get into what exactly that is. But all of that comes with the program. Each student has their own account um, and has all these separate activities that they can use individually. Deborah wants to know, um, do you use decodable or level text for assessment? Um, so we do a level based off of what, what level each student is on. And um, Becky wants to know, what are some home family activities to recommend for reading acceleration, including uh, to include family members? Yeah, I think Becky can probably speak to some of this too. Through the program, though, there are, like I said, with a separate account that each student has, there are games, there are activities for students to do independently, and it, it can become a family function. I know with um, there's Tic-Tac-Toe, there's Connect Four that all relate to just reading, which are great family games and activities to do together. Great. Teresa wants to know what program you were using before. <laughs> um, we tried OG, honestly, um, but at this age, we just found it hard to get our kids engaging um, because they're not learning the alphabet. They have a preconceived notion of the alphabet, um, but they're just struggling to read. So this was something completely different and something a lot more engaging for our kids. Great. And can do you think this program can be used for younger students? Absolutely. Absolutely. Yes. And I know Becky can probably speak on that, too. I've seen when we were going through uh, the training of the program. Yeah, we saw kindergartners, second graders, um, and we'll kind of talk about what that program looks like and how easy it is to actually catch on and learn these different things. Great. Well, thank you, Katie. Now we're going to bring <laughs> Becky back because she's going to continue um, with the four action steps. So we discussed assessment and performance. Now it's time for action. Well, thank you, Rita. So let's talk about um, now that we know exactly where our students performing and we've met with our team and we've created the plan and we have this trajectory. 
we have to put our plan in place. We have to implement. So two really important pieces of the action part is goal setting, like Katie mentioned, and then what tool, what intervention are we going to use to grow our students to grade level by the end of the year? So I want to start first about goal setting. So many of you um, participate or partake in case conferences. If you're a special education teacher, this is, um, you're extremely, uh, you're very savvy at writing goals and um, being able to look at classroom data, your own data, standardized data, and um, be able to draw conclusions about the needs of your students. Classroom teachers, you do the same thing. You are working with those students every single day and you have a clear understanding and vision of what goals should be. What I would like to challenge you to think about in adding in your practice, and I know that you work so very hard, but I think this step would be invaluable. When you're preparing for this conference or you're preparing for um, you know, getting your IEP ready for the next um, school year, have a conversation with the student. And if you already do this, great, keep doing it. But if you haven't, I'd like you to consider. And just talk with them about where they are, what their goals currently are, what kind of successes they've experienced, what things you think they need to continue working on, and then ask them this very simple question. What do you think? What do you think we should do? And you would be pleasantly surprised to find that they want to give you input. They want to talk about it. And when you explain to them that there is one special meeting, and this meeting is to talk about you and how you're doing in school, they're going to begin to see that my school really cares about me, and so do my teachers. And then when you're in that conference, you're going to be able to say, you know, when I spoke to my young man, my third grader, these were the things that he mentioned to me. So by seeking his input and taking it to the team, there's a really strong possibility of being able to incorporate that into their IEP or their goals. And then when you go back, you can say, you know what, your input, I shared it with everyone and it was really, really good and it was really important and we've added this. So now you've created buy-in, you've created ownership and you've let the student know that they've been heard. <clears throat> so that is very powerful in building that relationship. The next piece with all of that, after we've established goals and we've worked with the student to involve them in that process, um, we need to talk about an intervention. We need an intervention that is aligned to the science of reading, and it needs to make sure that it tackles and includes those uh, five key reading skills. And we want to make sure that our students are getting all of the support in whatever area or gap we know they need extra help. So in thinking about that, it's important that we design a, an approach that this pacing is accelerating them to get them to grade level. And it's gonna have any of those um, uh, concepts that are listed there right before you. The one thing that I would like to really draw your attention to is the end where it talks about accessibility. So that's really important in this day and age. We know that it's imperative that all students have access to grade level content. We can no longer minimize um, that need and it's imperative that they are able to um, read or be uh, given access to science and social studies and math and language arts. So we need to be thinking about how we're going to do that and how the intervention we use is going to give our students access. So now I'd like to talk to you from action, moving on to monitoring. Now, as a retired principal, I have to tell you, if I had known the impact that monitoring and progress monitoring makes 25 years ago, I would have, I would have done it every day. I would have encouraged all of my teachers and we would have found a way to make this an embedded part of our daily practice. It produces the kinds of outcomes and results that we want for students in schools. So listed before you are a couple of the ideas or strategies. First of all, you can progress monitor weekly or bi-weekly. You're gonna be monitoring that words correct per minute and the accuracy rate. And students are gonna be involved in the part of this, that we need them engaged in this progress monitoring process. And so I'd like to talk now about my third grade student. So we know with his benchmark data that he is reading independently with accuracy at about second grade, beginning of second grade. 
So if we're going to begin progress monitoring, um, we do not want to use third grade text. And this is why. We already know that it's too hard. We haven't yet closed that gap from second to third grade where we know they're reading independently. And we also need for them to see that they can be successful. And if you progress monitor with the same on grade level text, you're only going to see a few words of growth. And in some cases, we actually see a decline. And that is not going to begin driving that intrinsic motivation that we want to create in our students. So we want to progress monitor at their independent grade level. You may also hear people say off grade level. But in this case, our young man is going to be progress monitored at second grade. And what we found when we began to use this practice is that that first progress monitoring that is at their grade level, their words correct per minute was actually higher than that initial benchmark assessment that they took on grade level. And guess what it does? It gets them excited. They begin to see themselves as readers and they begin to feel success, uh, successful. So then the teacher can say, well, what, what about the next time? Let's set a goal. So you get them into this cycle of goal setting and achieving those goals. And what this does is it also propels them into what we call the, the virtuous cycle of learning. It's Daniel William and his, all of his research talks about how when you're successful at something and you want to keep doing it, and then as you're practicing it, you're getting better at it. And so then you're more successful. So that's what we want. It's no different than um, a video game. Students are always talking about leveling up. Well, they level up because they're practicing. Reading is the same exact thing. So we want students practicing and we want them practicing at their independent level. Now, one other thing I would challenge you to do, progress monitoring, make it a really big deal. And this is why. When you train your class that when it's time to progress monitor, they're working independently. They need to know that when you are progress monitoring, they're not going to bother you. Like not even if their hair is on fire. They know it's that important. And I had teachers that would put a boa around their neck or they'd put on a fancy hat or they had their magic wand in their hand. But everyone knew that we didn't bother the teacher. And the teacher then has three to four minutes of undivided time with one student. And that student knows that that teacher is going to listen to them, going to give them feedback, going to uh, ask them questions, and they're going to be able to ask questions of the teacher as well. And what this does is not only grow them academically in their reading, but it also will grow them social, emotionally, and the relationship they have with their teacher. And it's a really important time. I would also encourage you not to think of progress monitoring as assessing. Think of it as an opportunity, an opportunity to create and grow that relationship like we talked about, but also give feedback and support to your students in the area of reading and learning. Um, so yes. Part of the action steps. So obviously we needed something different and we needed something drastic to get our students caught up fast. Um, like I mentioned, at the middle school level, the engagement is so hard sometimes. Um, we needed to find something that they enjoyed and that they, they could keep, that we could keep them interested in. Um, and we really haven't found anything until we found this amazing program, Readable English. Uh, it has completely changed my students' attitude towards reading and it has given them access big word, um, to read all words and all the text. And we'll kind of talk about how it did that. Um, but my students have seen that this is helping them. They enjoy the program. They can, it's gaining, they're gaining confidence through the program. Um, the other day I gave my kids a survey just about readable English in general, thoughts on it, feelings on it. 91% of my eighth graders reported that they thought readable English was helping them become a stronger reader. As a teacher, obviously, I see how much progress that they are making, but it's so reassuring and nice to know that my students also know that they are being successful, and it just makes me so incredibly happy. <clears throat> so throughout the program, we were able to teach the intervention, um, and I kind of threw out the word glyphs, and we'll kind of touch base on that um, a little later, but it gave them access to all of their texts in any class. So while students see me for their special education services, whether it's reading or my other class, um, they are in the gen ed curriculum with their peers the majority of their day. So we needed to make sure that they had access to anything that was going on in their science class or social studies class or language arts or math 
or a related arts class. Um, we knew that obviously their deficits in reading made it hard for them to access a lot of the text, but this intervention allowed them to have access to any text on any grade level. Um, I have a student who is currently reading at a second grade level, and with this program, she is volunteering to raise her hand and read out loud in a class of eighth graders, which is just remarkable. As a teacher, that is exactly what you want to see. Her confidence has grown so much. Her self-esteem has grown up so much. And yes, she may fumble over a word or two, but she is working hard, trying to get through this, and knows that she needs to do this in order to become a better reader. Um, it is just so reassuring to know as a teacher that this program is helping and it is working, um, especially at this middle school age. Confidence and self-esteem is such a big issue. Um, to know that this is helping them with that is just wonderful news. Um, so these graphs are our data from our school year. So from the fall to the winter. Um, so this is our seventh grade data. Our readable English students increased their comprehension percentile ranks from the 16th percentile to the 25th percentile in just those few short months. And same with our eighth graders. They were able to increase their percentile rank in comprehension from the 26th percentile to the 40th percentile, all thanks to readable English. Um, so as we monitor, and we'll kind of talk about what these pictures mean, um, but after we were able to assess and see where each student's independent reading level was. Uh, we began progress monitoring off grade level, like Becky said, the importance of that every other week. So we were, uh, we gave a one minute passage. It was a cold read, so they've never seen it before. And we were able to calculate that words per minute and their accuracy scores. It was phenomenal. Students were able to see their growth and they were excited to see how far they came since their last read. I tried to preach to my students that progress is progress. Even if they read one more word or five more words or 10 more words, we have celebrated all because progress is progress. Um, as you can see, the cards um, in the middle and on the right picture um, are cards that I have hung, hanging up in my room. Um, no one else really knows what they mean. People know they're for my reading class, but it does not show the grade level that the student is reading on. It does not show you how many words per minute they're reading, but we kind of use it as a motivation tool. Um, so if a student improves from the last time that they read and progress monitored, they get a punch. And after three punches, they earn some sort of reward, whether that's a piece of candy, electronic lunch pass, free time, whatever it is. Um, it gets them reading. It gets them making sure that they are practicing throughout the week and doing the program to f fidelity um, and then realizing that there is something behind this and there is an end goal in sight for them. The other part of progress monitoring um, data kind of tracking that we do is each student has a folder in my classroom. And as you can see on the right, each student has this chart in their folder. Um, so every time that they come up to progress monitor, they bring their folder. After we graph to see how much they have improved. It's a visual for them. Our goal is obviously for them to be climbing that mountain to see how much that they are growing read after read. After we were able to look at all this data, um, at the beginning of the semester, I was able to conference with each of my students and we were able to look at their data from last semester for both words per minute and comprehension. And we were able to set their own goals for the rest of the school year. So our goals kind of um, were based off of the spring benchmark that will happen at the end of the year for both words per minute and comprehension. So they were able to tell me how much did they grow from the spring or the fall to the winter, and then how much more do they want to grow by the spring? So how many words per minute did they want to be able to read? And how many questions on their comprehension assessment did they, did they want to answer? Students were realizing that their reading was improving at a fast pace. Some of my students' goals were phenomenal, and I think they can meet them, but them being involved in the goal setting process is just so, so important. So as a special education teacher, and if you are one too, I know that accessibility is our big word. We want our students to be able to access everything, just like all the gen ed students. Um, so we needed to make sure that when, or I needed to make sure that when they leave my classroom and they go back into that gen ed curriculum, that they have access to every single text that all of their other peers do. 
This accessibility tool through the program allows just that. So as you can see, it kind of looks a little crazy. And when we started this off, I was like, what does this mean? But if you can see all these little glyphs, that keyword that I keep mentioning, they mean something. So all the little markings on the top or bottom of words means a different sound. So as we go through the program, there are 21 glyphs that students learn. And they you spend, you work at three glyphs on a at a time, and you spend about three days on it. So they get it real fast. There's always reteaching. You are always reviewing. So these just become automatic and are just in their mind. So if a student is reading this, they could say, oh, there's happy face. So I know that that makes the E sound. Therefore, that word is happy or that word is tolerably. Therefore, allowing them to access text in any class. Like I said before, students have an account that they can log into and they have access to convert any text into readable English text, um, converted text. So if they have a science passage that they're struggling to read, convert it and they're able to read it. Even if it's like two words that they can't read in a language arts article, convert it and they are able to read it. Um, at the end of the day, I am just very thankful for readable English. Um, as a teacher, of course, we all want to see the best in our students and we want to make sure that they succeed. And that is just exactly what I'm seeing with this program. Uh, it has brought my students such growth and success, and it has really transformed their attitudes towards school um, and given them the confidence to go out and do big things. Um, I am really looking forward to seeing how much more we progress to the end of the semester. Um, and it just makes me one happy teacher and a very strong advocate for this program. Well, Katie, that was a very lovely endorsement. Um, I'm going to ask Becky to come back. So we're going to just take one or two questions. Um, a lot of the questions are really coming in around how do you purchase readable English? What grade levels uh, it covers? So perhaps um, somebody from readable English could just post up there how to connect. People can connect with them direct. Um, but uh, Becky, would you just tell us a little bit about the grade levels that uh, this accessibility tool, Readable English, mm -hmm. um, addresses? So we have um, used, had students use Readable English um, as low as first grade and up through high school classes uh, and um, in alternative education settings. So it has um, the capability to help anyone who is uh, struggling with reading. Right, and somebody has just asked, can you use this with advanced readers as well? So that they could use one tool within their school um, for students at all levels. Absolutely, yes. Um, we have uh, several students who are considered high ability readers and um, some of them wanted to access text that um, was difficult for them, um, upwards of three, four, five grade levels above. Uh, we had one young lady that really loved everything about uh, Hamilton and the Articles of Confederation. She wanted to read all of that. So she was able to convert it and read it. So there really isn't any limitation on the usage or the people that are using our programs. Great. Um, and there's a question about Readable English being peer reviewed and the research behind Readable English. Mm -hmm. uh, again, I'll just throw this to the people at Readable English to post mm -hmm. in there. Um, a, a link to the research because it's got um, extensive research that has been conducted. Um, uh, somebody just asked, how do you handle school breaks? Do you help them set goals to keep going? How do you prevent regression? Katie? Yeah, so with this program, with each individual um, account that they have, there are a variety of assignments that they can just work on. Uh, it links to ReadWorks, which is amazing. So if you just assign them a few articles while they're working at home, they're still practicing reading. They're practicing that comprehension piece. And it is just an independent, when they have time, you can assign specific things to them um, just to get them practicing at home. Because I know regression can be so hard, um, especially we get two-week breaks, which is very hard for us. Um, but yeah. Next question is, does this program help with hmm. written expression? Um, yes, I've noticed it definitely helps with the spelling. Uh, we kind of work um, back and forth with when we convert text, then we do our practice with written expression and answering comprehension questions that way. Um, but I have definitely seen an increase of spelling, um, grammar, putting things into a correct sentence, um, all with the help of readable English. Okay. And then 
Uh, we do have Dana wanting to know, most mm -hmm. students with reading struggles have also difficulty writing. Um, uh, can this program help with writing? Yes. Yeah. Kind of like I just said, yeah, it helps with the spelling. It helps with the sentence fluency. Um, through the program, there's a lot of like taking all these words and putting in the correct sentence, um, figuring out what word uh, goes in the blank. Um, so there's a lot of things that can, hap that can help uh, with the written expression as well. Great. So guys, let me um, thank you very much. Let me just um, thank our sponsor again, Readable English. And a gift to staying until the end is a free PDF copy of the ebook, Why Learning to Read English is So Hard and How to Make it Easier. We've got the URL right there in the chat for you. So go grab your free uh, copy of our ebook. I, I hear it makes just fabulous um, uh, spring break reading for everyone. I just love this uh, quote and this um, YouTube uh, link to Tariana, who who uh, is a student who has uh, had her life changed when she learned to read in eighth grade. Welcome to Readable English, where students learn to read faster. Readable English is a research-proven, accelerated reading program where students take charge of their learning and quickly get to grade level and beyond. But don't take our word for it. Take it from Tariana. Tariana discusses how she loves reading with the glyphs. Like last year before we did all of this, I really like fell down. Like I'm never going to get nowhere because I don't know how to read. But now that I know the glyphs and I know how to like read with the glyphs, it makes me feel a lot much better. Like I go home and tell my mom like, yeah, I know how to do this. And I just learned this today. And normally I'd be like, yeah, she'd be like, what you learn? Like nothing, I don't know nothing. And now it feels like I can read much better. And I like it, like really, I like it. It's just great. Cause I, wa I wanted to switch schools, but I'm like, no, cause I have a program that's helping me with my reading. And I know another school don't have it, so. Might as well stay and get this year over with because I'm going to the high school next year. Thank you from Readable English. If you'd like to help your students accelerate their reading and achieve grade level and beyond, please contact us for a demo, readableenglish.com or 812-202-6267. Thank you. Have a great day and great reading. Thank you very much. Isn't that heartwarming? And, and thank you, Becky and Katie, for the important work you're doing. Um, for the Terrianas of the world. So we thank everybody. Our contact information is right here. Um, again, <clears throat> I'm particularly happy to answer any of your questions directly if you want to send them. Becky, I'm sure is the same. Katie, we thank you so much for all your hard work. And I see you're still at school. So I'm sure you're <laughs> starting right now. <laughs> That's okay. <laughs> no, thank you. No, it was great to share uh, the wonderful program that we're using. So thank you for having me. Great. So we're going to say sign off.